Hello everyone and welcome to the class. This is David A. Cox with PCClassesOnline.com and today we are going over everything that you need to know to get started with using your new iPhone. Now this class is going to run about an hour long or so. I'm going to cover all of the basics and really just try to get you feeling comfortable with your new phone. If after this class you want to explore a little bit further, you can check out all 238, as of today's date, classes that we have available on either our website at pcclassesonline.com, which is a free open source public service, or on our YouTube channel. In fact, if you check out on your screen right now, you should see the YouTube icon appear. If you click on that icon, you will be able to subscribe to our channel so that when we come out with future live classes or our pre-recorded classes, you'll be able to check those out as well. And finally, if you do ever want to attend, we do live classes every Wednesday and Saturday. Those are also the same dates that we come out with new classes on our YouTube channel. Um, but those can all be attended from anyone, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You can find all the information about that on our website. So let's get started. We're going to start off with talking about the various buttons on the iPhone. Then we're going to go into settings. I'm going to give you several tips and tricks along the way. So let's get started. We're going to go over the buttons here. Now the phone that you are looking at right now is a simulated image of the phone in front of me, which is in fact my phone. So if I swivel back and forth, you can see I move the icons right here. So let's start off with this button here on the right hand side. Now this is an iPhone 6 Plus. If you have an iPhone 6 or 6 Plus or something newer, probably everything you see here is going to be the same. One of the things I do like to mention at the beginning of every class is the date. And today's date is Wednesday, November 19th, 2014, where it's a high of 37 degrees here in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Yummy beach day. So uh, I like to mention that to keep it relevant, because if you're watching this class and it's a year into the future, probably want to check out and see if we have a newer, more updated version of this class. Here on the right hand side, we have what is referred to as the sleep switch. So if you either need to put your phone to sleep, you can click it once and it'll go to sleep. You can either wake it up by pressing that button again, or alternatively, you can also press the home button. That would be the button you see at the very bottom of the phone. I'm actually going to move this just a little bit up so you can see it better there. Now, the other thing that the uh, sleep switch does is if you press and hold it, you're going to see here you get the option to completely power down your phone. Now, with the iPhone, there's really no need to ever do this um, because your phone is very um, energy efficient, so you might as well just let it sleep when you're not using it. Let's hit cancel. Um, I'm going to go over the buttons here now on the left hand side, starting with the one you see up top here. The first one is a toggle switch, and that will toggle your phone between silent mode, where it's not going to ring. Let's see if I can get that. Yep, there we go. So when you see that little bell icon, it means it's going to ring. And if I toggle it, now it's in silent mode. So just if you're going to something like a movie theater or some sort of a business meeting, probably a good idea to put your phone in silent mode. Beneath that, we have two buttons here, which are the volume buttons. Uh, the one on top is volume up. The one at the bottom is volume down. So if, let's say you're playing a YouTube video and you have trouble hearing it, just press and hold that top button. Now, some of the different buttons on the iPhone have different uses, depending on either uh, if you combine them with other buttons or if you hold them for different amounts of time. I'm going to eventually go over all of those today, but I'm going to go over them in a very specific order that I've designed to help give this class a very good flow, if you will. Finally, we have here the home button, probably the most important button on the phone. It brings you to this main screen, it brings you home. So if I'm in an app, let's say I'm in the health app, okay, and I want to go back, I can just press that button once and it goes back to the main screen. Now that button especially has different uses. We will go over them as we come across the different topics. The next thing that we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk about some of the various settings in your phone. To do that, we have a little icon here. It looks like a gear at the top right corner of my phone, maybe in a different location on yours. Just tap on that, and we're going to go through these items. We're not going to go through everything, but we're going to go through quite a few of them. Airplane mode, pretty self-explanatory. When you toggle that on, it's going to shut off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, basically the two wireless connections your phone has as well as cellular. Sorry, I forgot about that one. 
The next item down you see there is Wi-Fi. So, of course, when you are first getting out your phone, you're going to want to connect to your home wireless network because when you're using Wi-Fi, you're not using cellular data, which most people pay for. So if we go into that, you will be able to see all of the wireless networks in your area. If you see a lock icon next to it, it means that that network is password protected. So when you go to join it, you're going to need to type in whatever password that may be. Your phone will then save that password so you don't need to type it in next time. Good idea is if you, let's say, have a cafe that you go to frequently, it's a good idea to do this right away. That way, when you're in the cafe checking, let's say, your email on your phone or checking your Facebook updates, you're not using your cellular data because you're using Wi-Fi instead. We're actually going to talk a lot more about Wi-Fi at the very end of this class. I like to go occasionally a little bit off topic if it pertains to a piece of information that I feel could affect a lot of people out there. And there's a really important note I like to always put out there about Wi-Fi. We'll get to that at the end of the class. I don't want to overwhelm you right now. The third item down you see is Bluetooth. Examples of Bluetooth devices could be a pair of headphones. I love my, I just got in a pair of Bose Bluetooth headphones. Um, some people use headsets uh, for talking on the phone. But if you don't use Bluetooth, it's a really good idea to turn Bluetooth off because it does use a lot of energy. And I'm going to give you a few different tips and tricks today to help conserve battery life on your phone. Now, if you want to see all of those tips and tricks, I'll have a link at the end of the video to basically every trick that you can use to really conserve battery life on your phone. Fourth item down is cellular, okay? The important thing I want to mention about cellular is let's say you are traveling internationally. It is very important before you travel. If you are going to be using your phone, you need to call your cell phone company ahead of time and get some sort of a cellular data package. And if you don't, it's very important to turn this feature off. I have chatted with clients of mine who have gone, let's say, on a trip to Europe we're based out of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. So they go over to Europe for, let's say, two weeks. They come back and they get a $2,000 phone bill because cellular data was running in the background on international data. So good idea to turn that feature off if you are abroad. Let's go back. The uh, next item you see here may or may not appear on your phone. It kind of depends on where you live in the world and also who your cell phone provider is and also what your plan is. Personal hotspot is the ability to use your phone to get another device online. So let's say I'm traveling on a train, okay? My laptop has no way to connect to the internet. So be, what I can do is plug my phone into my computer I can actually do it wirelessly, but I can turn personal hotspot on and now I can use my phone to get my laptop online. It's a pretty cool feature for those who need it. Now, in most cases of most cellular companies, there is a monthly fee to be able to do this, but I'm not going to speak for everyone. You have to call your company to find out if that's an option and what they charge. The next item you see down here is notifications, and that has to deal with um, things that you get that pop up on the screen. And uh, it's a good idea to go through these items here and you're going to find it to be more and more important as you download more and more apps to run on your phone. So let's say I don't really care about getting a notification every time someone likes one of my posts on Facebook. Okay. Well, I can go here into Facebook, for example, and I can turn notifications off by just tapping on that very, very top option. Okay, so it just means that's going to go away. The more items that you have that give you notifications, the more battery life it is going to use. So again, just good idea to go through these items and only enable what you want. There's also different types of alerts you can have. So if I go, for example, into, uh, let's go into Cal, which is a great calendar app if you don't like the uh, native calendar app, which personally I don't. You can choose to have it either give you sort of a little drop down uh, icon here, a drop down notification, or a full alert that takes over the whole screen where you have to tap on it to clear it. Um, so for more important alerts, you may want to use this item, this function here on the right. For other items, just use banners. Okay, let's go back. The next item we see here is Control Center. I would actually recommend leaving that the way it comes. It's pretty much perfect, at least for what I recommend for my clients. 
Next item we have here is do not disturb. This is a good one. I have it turned on manually right now because of the fact that I'm teaching this class, uh, but you would only turn it on manually if you're, let's say, going into some sort of a conference, uh, if you're doing a presentation and you're doing sort of what I'm doing here where you're mirroring your phone to a computer screen. But more importantly is this item right here, scheduled. So what do not disturb mode does is let's say I put some sort of a post out on Facebook, on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash pcclassesonline.com. Sorry, pcclassesonline, no.com. And you like my post or you comment on my post. Well, if it's three in the morning, I really don't care to have my phone ding. So what you can do is turn this feature on. And it just means that between these two hours, if I get a text message, if I get a phone call, if I get a, some sort of a notification, it's not going to light up my phone. It's not going to ring. Okay, it's just going to be there for me when I wake up in the morning. Now, there are exceptions to the rules, and that's where we get into these further options. So if you save someone to your phone as a favorite contact, if they try to call you and it's 2 in the morning, it will ring. The other part, and I would very strongly recommend you enable this feature, is repeated calls right here. What that means, and this is important to know as someone who has an iPhone and as someone who may call someone with an iPhone. Let's say I have an emergency and I need to call you and it's again 2 in the morning. If I call you and you have do not disturb mode turned on, it's going to go straight to voicemail. But if I call you back a second time, your phone is going to ring. Because as you can see in the description there, it's less than three minutes from the last time I tried to contact you. So if it is that crazy stupid o'clock in the morning and your phone goes off, it means it's either someone who's in your favorites or it could be an emergency because that person has now tried to call you twice in a very short period of time. So just good thing to be aware of. If your phone goes off, it's probably best to answer it. Let's go back. Uh, the next item uh, we can see here is general settings. And I'm only going to go through a few items here, and I'm going to give you resources if you want to go into more depth with this. So the uh, second item down you see there is software update. And I want to show you something here. If you look at the bottom uh, left corner of my phone, see how there's a little red number one next to mail? That means I have one new message. If you see that red number one where it has the settings icon up here, that means that you have a software update, and a software update affects the entire phone. So it's a good idea when you do software updates to have your phone receiving power and connected to a Wi-Fi connection because they're typically very large. Um, and when you do this, it is going to have to reboot your phone. Just be aware of that. Um, the other thing I always like to recommend to our clients is when you get these giant updates that are available uh, for things like going from the latest operating system to the next step operating system. So right now where we are in time, it's iOS 8. That's what they call it. Um, when iOS 9 comes out, what I recommend doing is before you go and immediately update, let me play with it for 24 hours and figure out if there's any bugs in the operating system. And one way you can kind of protect yourself from accidentally upgrading, because once you do it, you can't go back in time, you can sign up for our newsletter. If you go to pcclassesonline.com on the homepage, if you scroll down, we have a simple newsletter. We usually don't email you more than once per month. But when something like that comes out, I will test it. And for example, when iOS 8 came out, I said, hey, if you have an iPhone 4S or an iPad 2, you might want to hold off because those are older pieces of technology. It's not going to run as well. And so our clients who got that newsletter hopefully didn't upgrade. And then eventually they create software updates where it now works a lot better than it did back then. And by the way, at this point in time, it's pretty good for everyone uh, at this stage of the game. The next item that you see down there is Surrey. And uh, we're going to talk briefly about this. If you want to learn a lot more about some of the different uh, things that Surrey can do for you, we're going to have an entire class devoted to that coming out very, very soon. So check our website or our face, our YouTube page, rather, and we'll be sure to post that when it comes out. So here in Surrey settings, there's a few different things here. First of all, definitely toggle the first two options. That's just my opinion. Um, the first one is just that it will work. 
The second one is this pretty cool feature, and I use this all the time when I'm driving in the car, because after all, we don't want to have to look at our phone, because that's distracted driving, that's unsafe. But let's say I'm driving the car, and I need to find out when uh, my next appointment is. When I have this feature enabled, without having to even touch my phone, provided that my phone is receiving power, I can just say the words, and I'm going to cover the microphone so it doesn't do it right now, and hopefully it'll work. I can say, hey, Surrey, when is my next... No, oh, it tried to do it. Okay. <laughs> I can say, hey, the name of the application we're talking about right here, and I can say, when is my next appointment? And without having to look at my phone, without having to touch my phone, it will fetch that kind of information. Um, but that works with everything that you could normally use Surrey for. Some people find this to be a pain in the butt. Sometimes it'll go off randomly. Um, but again, it only is going to use that feature if it is receiving power. Finally, here at the very, very bottom, I want to recommend that you tell Surrey who you are. It's very important when it comes to uh, giving Surrey commands like give me directions home, uh, when you want it to um, contact certain people. If I say, for example, Surrey, call my sister, it knows who that is. Um, so it's a good idea to make sure that your contact card in contacts is accurate. And then you're going to point Surrey to that particular contact. Let's go back. Um, we're going to skip a few of these items here. Um, what I want to mention is if you do want to learn about how to dramatically increase your battery life in your iPhone, um, there's going to be a little button that should appear on your screen at the very end of this class. Um, it's a good follow-up class to this one. It's just a ton of different settings in your phone that you can, if you want, disable that will improve your overall battery life. Um, the next one we're going to talk about here is background app refresh. If you see it down there, because that is an important one. These are all of the different apps that have the ability to access the internet even when you're not using them. It's a good idea to go through these items here and disable the ones that you don't care about. So for example, if you look at the second to last item sort of down there is Dropbox. Uh, that's a cloud service. I don't need Dropbox to get my data when I'm not using the app. So I can turn that feature off. It's, this is one of the things that we actually do mention in that class. The next item we're going to talk about is display and brightness. And you'll see here we can uh, change the auto brightness. It's a good idea to keep it right where you see it on my screen, right around 70% if you can imagine that as a scale, and turn auto brightness off. It just means that, let's say it's a dark movie theater, there's no reason to have your phone super, super bright. Okay. So the next item you see there, display zoom. Um, basically, it's going to show larger uh, app icons. It's especially helpful in the iPhone 6 Plus or, again, once the newer iPhones come out, um, whichever is the larger model. It's a pretty cool feature. I like that to be enabled. Not everyone does. If you have trouble reading text on your phone, you might want to go here into where it says text size. There's a little slide bar. You can move it to the right, and you'll notice as I do, all that text gets bigger. Okay. I like to keep it right there. The next item that we're going to talk about is wallpaper. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, your phone does come with plenty of different wallpapers. The one that you see on mine is actually a photo that I shot. I have an aerial drone that I fly and photograph all of Cape Cod with. It's a pretty amazing uh, little gadget. And yes, I have a severe gadget addiction. Uh, you can go into where it says choose a new wallpaper. You can choose from any photos that are in your phone, or you can choose one of Apple's provided wallpapers. My one little tip here, don't use anything in Dynamic. Dynamic uses a ton of battery life. Don't use it. But if you use their still images, they're pretty beautiful. You might want to check them out. The next item we have here is sounds. I don't think we need to actually go into it, but that's where you can change your ringtone. You can change the sound your phone makes when you get a text message, an email, that kind of thing. The next item down is Touch ID. Uh, that's a really great feature to enable. Forgive me, I'm going to have to black out the screen here as I'm going to type in my password. Um, but what Touch ID does is this little home button here is actually a fingerprint sensor. So without having to put in some sort of a passcode to get into your phone, you can just simply use your fingerprint. And you can see here at the very top, you can use Touch ID to unlock your phone. You can use it for Apple Pay, which we'll talk about in just a moment. You can also use it to purchase music and apps and movies, that kind of thing, anything in iTunes or the App Store.
So to set this up is pretty simple and when you first get your phone it will automatically suggest that you enable it. But you just touch add a fingerprint and you're going to have to just simply um, lightly press the home button. You don't actually depress it, you're just laying your finger on top of it. And when it vibrates, you're going to lift your finger up and put it back down until it tells you that it's complete. One piece of advice in regards to setting up the fingerprint sensor is I strongly recommend don't hold your finger perfectly, you know, straight in front of your phone. Hold it the way you would normally hold your phone, which for most people out there is going to be uh, in their right hand, and they're going to want to do this with your thumb and your index finger. And I would actually do it on both. So you can see here I have four fingerprints enabled. This for both of my thumbs and both of my index fingers. So it just means no matter what hand I'm using, I can very easily unlock my phone, make purchases, that kind of thing. Scroll down a little bit further, you can tell it to immediately require that passcode, and you can do a simple passcode, strongly recommended. It's just four digits. So let's say I have to uh, hard reset my phone. When you reset your phone, you cannot use Touch ID first. You have to first use your four digit passcode. So you have sort of a backup plan uh, for whatever may happen. It's also really handy if you live somewhere cold, like where we are right now. Um, if you wear gloves, you know, you can't use your fingerprint sensor, so instead you can just use those touch screen gloves and uh, put in manually the uh, four digit code. Going back here, uh, the next item we have here that we're going to talk about, uh, I just want to mention iCloud. We have an entire class on iCloud coming out very, very soon. This is an updated version of our pre-existing iCloud class where we really talk about how it works and how you can use it. It's very, very helpful for syncing your data between your phone, your iPad, and your laptop or computer of whatever type it may be. Um, the one thing I'll mention about iCloud, it does not play well with Outlook. So if you're on a PC, um, there's no there's no brilliant way to get it to work well. iTunes and App Store and also App, uh, Passbook and Apple Pay. This is uh, where it gets into making purchases of different apps. Now in iTunes and App Store, I'm going to have to blur out part of this, um, you can basically tell it so that if you make a purchase of music, apps, books, or if you update something, if an app update comes out rather, you can have it automatically download. So if I am on my laptop, for example, and I purchase a piece of music, it's automatically going to put that music on my phone. I don't have to do anything for that to happen. Now to set up an Apple ID, you need an email address of some sort. It's pretty simple to do this. You need a credit card on file or you can also use an Apple gift card. Some people are very um, uh, cautious about giving out that information. Um, they haven't been hacked yet as of today's date. I put my faith in them. Uh, I'm, I put my credit card on with it. I think it's pretty safe. But if you're still cautious, I just want you to know that you can alternatively use an Apple gift card. Uh, so let's go back. Passbook and Apple Pay. Um, let's talk about the both of them, starting with Apple Pay. So what Apple Pay does, it's a relatively new feature, again, as of today's date, where you can put a credit card on file. And so let's say I'm going to some sort of a store and I make a purchase. Instead of having to even take out my credit card, now some of these credit card scanners have an Apple Pay feature where you just put your phone by that little scanner. It'll ask you to press your fingerprint on the touch sensor on the home button. And that's it. It'll charge your credit card. It's very, very simple. Now, um, the other part of this is Passbook. And where Passbook comes in handy is if you're, I find especially if you're going to a concert or if you're going to the airport, if you're going to take a flight. A lot of times now when you make a purchase of some sort of a ticket, they give you an option to add it to Passbook. And what's great about this is when I go to the airport now, I don't bring a paper ticket. My phone senses that I'm at the airport and it launches Passbook. With a little QR code, they scan it and I get on the plane. Very, very simple. Let's go back. Mail, contacts, and calendars. This is where you can tell your phone to talk to your other email services like Gmail or Yahoo or one of those other ones out there. Um, I want to talk very, very briefly about a important technology difference that you should probably be aware of. And I'm going to go a little bit techy for a moment, but I'm going to try to make it so that you can all follow this. 
there are two different types of email technology out there. One is referred to as POP and the other is referred to as IMAP. Now in my professional opinion, IMAP is the good one. I do not like POP accounts. And I'll give you an example of the difference. So a lot of POP accounts are the various internet providers out there. So for example, where we live, we have Comcast as our TV, internet. We don't use a phone, but our phone provider as well. Landline, that is. And so when you sign up with Comcast, they give you, they kind of force you to have an email address with them. That doesn't mean you have to actually use it. The reason why I don't recommend those type of accounts is, let's say you have one. If I send an email to your POP email address, what it's going to actually do is I'm not emailing you. I'm emailing them. They beam a copy of that message to you. And where that gets to be a problem is when you have multiple devices. So if you have, for example, an iPhone, an iPad, and a Mac, every time you receive a message, you have to delete it here, here, and here. So that's where I tend to recommend going with IMAP accounts. The two services that I like to recommend, I'll give three actually, are Gmail, iCloud.com, and also if you decide to have your own domain name, some people do that, there's a company that I use all the time called Bluehost.com. They're fantastic. I strongly uh, recommend them. Again, that's only if you want your own domain name. Uh, the next uh, future items you see down here, we don't really uh, need to go into today. I'll give you one little tip here about Safari. Safari is your web browser in the phone. Uh, what I would recommend doing, if you scroll down here, is that you enable it to block pop-ups. None of us like pop-ups. And I'd also turn this feature on called Do Not Track. By default, that is actually turned off. So that's my little recommendation. Um, so now that we've covered the settings, what I want to do is I want to start to talk about some of the other features in your phone, starting with Control Center. Now when you're on your phone, sometimes you need to get access to some of the settings that I just went over, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, maybe you're playing your music and you need to go to the next track. And the easiest way to do that is to launch Control Center. And the way you do that is you're going to take your finger at the bottom, actually off the screen, okay, sort of down here in this little white area and swipe up. So when I do that, I get this little screen here. This is a really fast way to get into some of those settings. So for example, up here we have the airplane mode. You can with one tap turn that on. This is the uh, next to it. We have the button to turn Wi-Fi on or off. Next to that we have Bluetooth. The little moon icon that you see there, that is do not disturb mode. That is a manual switch. So while I have this enabled, my phone will not ring. You have to manually turn that off to turn to make it um, go off so that you will start to receive phone calls. The item that you see next to it is lock orientation. So for example, if I'm reading a book on my iPhone 6 Plus and my hand is positioned so that the phone might have trouble telling which way I'm reading it, the screen could kind of go back and forth between portrait mode, the way you see it here, and landscape mode where it's on its side. By enabling lock, the lock mode, it's going to keep it on whatever type screen you have. Below that, we have your music control. So if I had music playing, I could go to the previous track, the play button right there, that's play or pause. And then the one to the right over here is next track. Beneath that, we have volume. Oops, I skipped over. Sorry. Over here is your brightness. So if you scroll this down to the left, it's going to dim your screen. If you, uh, if you scroll to the right, it's going to make it brighter. At the bottom left here, we have a cool feature called AirDrop. And AirDrop, uh, we actually have an entire class on. You can check that out, again, either on our YouTube page or pcclassesonline.com. Uh, the one that you see to the right of that, you can pretty much ignore. That is AirPlay. That is the technology that I use in order to be able to teach this class. That's how you're able to see my phone right now. Now beneath that we have four icons. Starting on the left, that is flashlight. So for those of you who have an app left over from an older iPhone where it would leave your flash on to act as a flashlight, you don't need it anymore. You can tap that, it'll turn the flash on on your phone so that you can see in the dark. Next to it we have a clock, that is your clock setting. So if you need to set a timer or if you need to set an alarm so you wake up at a certain time, it'll get you into there. Next to that we have a calculator. And then finally, we have your camera. So that's a one way to get directly into the camera. We'll talk a lot more about that later on. 
The next item we're going to talk about is Notification Center, which is basically the exact opposite way you get in. So for Control Center, we swiped up from the very, very bottom. To get into Notification Center, we're going to swipe down from the very, very top of the screen. Sorry, my cursor keeps disappearing on me. So when I do that, um, I have my calendar and all that data signed out right now so you don't see anything. It'll give you uh, information like the temperature. Um, so it's telling me it's right now it's a very, very warm 37 degrees, clearly a beach day here. Uh, and that's Fahrenheit, by the way, for those of you Europeans. Um, your calendar, you can tell it exactly what information you want. That all comes uh, from the settings. If you scroll up, you're going to also potentially see different widgets. Now these are basically apps that are on my phone, but it's pulling information into Notification Center. For example, I love this little app called Argus. It's a free app. It's a pedometer. Your phone can track how many steps you take in a day. And you can see here, I have been clearly very, very lazy today. But then again, it's also the morning. Um, Hue is a, a app. We have a class coming out on Philips Hue. It's basically these smart uh, Wi-Fi light bulbs. So you can turn all the lights on in your home, even when you're not home. Scrolling down further, you can gain access to stocks. Uh, this next one is a great little widget. If you download the app called TV Guide, it'll show you what popular shows are on tonight. I just find that to be useful. Uh, and then uh, that's about it. If you ever want to add additional widgets to your phone, basically the way these widgets work is they talk to apps that you've already installed into your phone. So if I tap on that edit button at the very, very bottom, I'll see all of the various apps here that I can use that will talk to Notification Center. Um, so, for example, I don't have Evernote, I don't have um, Instant Replay. Those I don't really care about. I don't use traffic conditions because I live on Cape Cod and we have one major road for the whole area. Um, so that's kind of how you can add or remove any of those items. So if you don't care about seeing your calendar, you can tap that little minus symbol and delete it. Now the other tab you'll see here is notifications. So these are alerts that you've received. I may have to blur the screen here. Yes, I will. Um, so for example, missed phone calls that you've received. Um, could be headlines from your favorite news source or whatever it is. N no, CNN is not my favorite news source. I shouldn't have said that. Um, but other items that you've received, text messages, missed um, FaceTime calls, that kind of thing. You'll find all of those there under notifications. If you ever want to clear these out, you can just tap the little X up here. And then it will say clear. Tap it again. And it's gone. That's Notification Center. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about very briefly is messages. Now messages is this icon here at the bottom left. Okay, see the little green box there? And so this is basically your text messages um, and also what are referred to as iMessages. Now one thing I want to mention here, this is a conversation with my assistant. Um, sometimes you may notice that the, see how my text there is in blue? Sometimes you may see it in blue. Sometimes it may be green. I want to let you know the difference between the two. If it's blue, it means that the person you're having the conversation with is probably on an iPhone. Um, and so what that means is that it's sending it using a different technology than an actual text message, and it does not count against you. So if you have one of those cell phone plans where you're only allotted, let's say, a thousand text messages a month, if it's blue, it doesn't count against you. If it's green, it means that the person who you're communicating with is either on an Android phone. It can also be that they have an iPhone, but they're just not uh, in good range. And the way the phone determines this is they look at what is going to be the fastest method to deliver your message. So let's say I'm in my home where I have Wi-Fi and I'm communicating with someone else who also has an iPhone and is in Wi-Fi. iMessage is going to be the fastest way to send it, so it's going to be blue. Now you can disable uh, some of these features. If you go into settings, there is a setting for messages and uh, I can actually show you that I believe real quickly. I'll probably once again have to blur out the screen. Hey, I don't have to. But you can see it right there. So I would recommend you have iMessage turned on. Um, also, uh, send as SMS if you look there at the bottom. So what that means is if iMessage is not available, it is going to try to send it as a text message. I have quite a few in my plan, so that's why I decide to use this. If you don't, 
you may not want to just understand you run the risk of messages not being delivered so if you find that to be the case that could be what's going on next we are going to talk about the camera now I have my phone right now on my desk and I'm gonna actually keep it there because I just don't want to have any real distractions here so when you go into the camera let's see if I can uh, get it to orient correctly there we go Good. I'm going to keep it that way. So my phone right now is tilted to the side. Um, you can take a photo a few different ways, technically two different ways. You can press this little white button you see here on the screen. Sorry, I don't know why my cursor keeps going out on me. Um, you can press that, but also I made a mention that you can do a few other things with some of the buttons on your phone. The volume plus button, if you take a look at the way it's oriented right now, is at the top right corner. If you press the volume plus button, while you're in the camera app, it will take a photo. It's the same thing as it's a shutter, basically. So uh, a few other things that you can do here I want to show you. If you look on the left-hand side at this point, it's going to change depending on how you're holding your phone. That top left button, that is to switch from the back-facing camera to the front-facing camera or vice versa. The button beneath that is a timer. So I find, especially if I'm going to take a selfie and if there's other people in the photo, sometimes I really have to stretch my arm out. It'll give you a little countdown, so it's a lot easier for me to hit that, and it gives me a three, two, one, and then snaps the photo. So I can hit that, really extend my arm, and get a good shot. HDR stands for High Dynamic Range. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it means that you're going to basically take photos that are balanced for two different lighting conditions. The example I always tend to use is a sunset. So you have someone who's you know, posing for the photo and behind them is a sunset. Your foreground is going to be darker than your background. So it takes two photos, one that's balanced for the sunset, one that's balanced for the person posing, and it meshes them in to one photo. Finally, at the very bottom there, you have the flash option. You can go with on, off, or auto. My recommendation is I usually keep mine set to off. And the reason why is a lot of photos actually look better without a flash. Now, that being said, when they went to a two-tone flash starting with the iPhone 5S, it does look a lot better than it used to. And I want to give you an additional trick here, and you're going to be able to share this one with your friends. Let's say you're on your friend's phone, and you take a photo, and there's a flash, and there's this sort of white haze around the image. You may have seen this before. Usually, that is an indication that they have a case on their iPhone that is too thick. I'm going to try my best to describe this, but if you look at your iPhone case, a lot of them have this little lip that sticks out by where the camera is. And what happens is when the flash comes out, it refracts off of that little piece of plastic and it goes back into the lens. And so that's what causes that white haze effect. That's why I really like very, very slim profile cases. Uh, if you ever want, there's a bunch of uh, accessories and iPhone cases that I recommend that I've tested out. Um, I'll have a link to where you can get check them all out uh, in the description of this video. So for those of you who are watching this on our website, it'll be just beneath the video. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, there's a little section that says more info. You can click there. You'll see the hyperlink there. So uh, next, I want to show you another feature here. I'm going to tilt so that we have the other there we go. So now we're back in uh, portrait mode. So if you look at the bottom of the image, see how it says photo right now? To get to any of those other modes, all you have to do is swipe with your finger to the left or right. So for example, if I swipe to the left, we go into video mode. Um, the iPhone 6 Plus especially shoots incredible video. When you've watched any of our classes where you see me appear in the opening, recently we have actually started shooting that intro with this phone. Uh, we used to use a Nikon camera, but now we use an iPhone. It's amazing, the quality. Um, the other thing you'll find when you're shooting video uh, in the 6 Plus and other future models that carry the same technology is it has this amazing ability to auto-stabilize the video. So it looks like it's on a steady cam, just like in a TV show. Very, very cool stuff. If you swipe over again, you have slow-mo mode where it will basically shoot at a higher frame rate. So it slows everything down when you play it back. It's great for action shots, great for sports. Next, we have the exact opposite. We have time-lapse mode. Time-lapse is a lot of fun to experiment with. 
I want to give you a little tip here. Uh, if you want to get into time-lapse photography, there's this great, really, really simple accessory that you can get. It actually goes on your pre-existing tripod, but it allows you to use any iPhone, Android, or any other smartphone for that matter with your pre-existing tripod. So it'll keep it still because you cannot shoot time-lapse uh, just by holding your phone still. It'll be too shaky when you play it back. So with time-lapse, obviously, if you're familiar with it, it takes a bunch of photos and it kind of turns it into video. So things appear to go very, very fast. It's great for nature. I love filming clouds go by because they look like they whoosh right by. If we go back the other way, there's a couple other items here. We have square mode. It's exactly like a photo. It's just cropped to be a square. And then we have pano mode. Um, let's say you go to the beach, okay? You might not be able to fit the entire photo in the frame. So what you do with this is you would start off with your body sort of tilted towards the left, hit the shutter button there, the white button underneath where it says pano, and then you would slowly rotate your body trying to keep your torso as steady as possible towards the right and it will stitch it into one photo. And that is the camera. The next feature we're going to talk about is we're going to go over some of the features that you're going to find in the mail program. So here we have a account that I really just use when I'm giving a demonstration of some sort. So please don't ever send an email to this address that you're going to see on the screen. So uh, when you first open up your mail, it's going to bring you to your inbox. If you have multiple inboxes, you'll be able to hit the back button that you see there at the top left, and that'll bring you back so you can go through each account. Now, I want to give you a few tricks here that are good to know. Um, sometimes when you get messages, you just you know immediately want to delete them, whether you can tell they're spam or whatever it may be. So in this case, there are a few different ways that you can very quickly delete messages. The first is you can hit the edit button at the top right corner, and you can now tap on each message that you want to delete. And if so, if you look at the bottom right, it says trash. If I hit that, it would trash all of those messages. Sometimes you may notice it will say trash. Other times it will say archive. It ultimately depends on what program you're using. For example, with iCloud.com, it says trash. With Gmail, it says archive. I'm going to hit cancel for now and show you a few other ways. If you slide with your finger, I'm going to use the last message that you see there. If you slide your finger from the right to the left, you're going to see that it kind of gives you these other options here. You can trash it, you can flag it, or if you hit more, there's a bunch of other options that you can access here. For example, you can reply to it from here. You can forward it, mark it as unread, move it to junk, move the message into a different folder, or notify me. I want to mention the notify me option because um, I think all the others are fairly self-explanatory. Let's say you have a really important deal that's about to go down or some sort of a conversation that's really critical. If you hit notify me, it will give you a special alert when you hear back from that person. So for really important conversations, you can just use this ability to mark it so you can notify you. It will notify you when the person responds. The other trick that I want to show you is if instead of just dragging your finger from the right to the left a little bit, if you drag all the way over, it will immediately trash the message. The other way you can do it is you can, of course, go into the message, and if you look at the very bottom of the screen, there is a little trash icon. You can do that too. And while we're on the screen, I'm going to show you some of the other features we have here. So, for example, at the bottom right corner, looks like a pen on paper. That is your compose button. So you can type in who this is going to, the subject. And another trick I want to show you here is uh, let me just tap into the actual message here. Now, you see, of course, we have the little keyboard that appears there at the bottom. If I need numbers or symbols, the little one, two, three button, that's sort of like a shift key. So it gets you a bunch of those symbols. But there's a much easier way to do this. Next to the space bar, there's a little microphone icon. Built into your iPhone, as long as you have some sort of an internet connection, whether it's through Wi-Fi or cellular, you can dictate. So check this out. Let's say I'm sending a message to my mother. Hey, Mom, how are you doing today? Question mark. New paragraph. Can't wait to see you and Dad next weekend. All the best. Period. New paragraph. Your son. New paragraph, David. Period. New paragraph, bring money. Okay, so that's a little bit about how dictation works. You'll notice that you can speak 
really anything you can speak in punctuation. You can speak speak um, if you need to move down to the next paragraph. It's really, really simple. And as you speak, it will type it for you. Let's hit cancel since I don't think my mother would appreciate that. And move on to some of the other options here. At the bottom next to where we have the little send note, we have the reply button. So that little arrow is reply, forward, or print. Now, in order to print this, you do need an AirPrint compatible printer. Or if you go to our website at pcclassesonline.com, we do have a class on how to trick your printer so that it will print from your iPhone or iPad. Uh, it involves using an extra application. It's different on the Windows computer than it is for a Mac, but uh, it's a pretty handy feature if you need that kind of thing. Um, to the left of the trash can icon, you'll see there's a folder. That is for if you have a folder for, let's say, like receipts, maybe one for uh, information about an upcoming trip. You can move the message into that particular folder. And flag will just simply flag it. Pretty self-explanatory. Let's go back. Okay, we're done with email. The next thing we're going to talk about here briefly is Surrey. Now, Surrey is the automated voice assistant uh, built into the iPhone. It's been in the iPhone since the iPhone 4S and newer. And the way you activate Surrey is by simply pressing and holding the home button. Let me make sure I have my audio turned up here. So hopefully you will maybe be able to hear this. So um, there's a lot of different commands that you can give Surrey, um, especially it's useful, I find, in dealing with calendar items, when calling people, uh, finding out information about movies that are playing in your area, sports scores. That's a joke. I don't watch sports. Um, but really anything you need with that. You can also turn things like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth on or off. We have an upcoming class. I mentioned it already. Um, that's going to be coming out very soon on all of the different Surrey commands. So let's just give it a shot and see how it is. You can also just have fun and mess with Surrey. So let's try it out. Hello, Surrey. How are you doing today? Excellent. You can get things like uh, weather. What's the weather going to be like tomorrow? That's pretty windy. So there you go. There's my depressing info for the day. That's a little bit about Surrey. Again, if you want to learn more about it, it's a really handy feature in the iPhone. You can find that class on pcclassesonline.com. Next, I want to show you how to move these icons around. Okay, So if you ever want to either create a folder of apps or move them, it's pretty simple. So let's say I want to take some of the apps here that I don't ever use, like Game Center, Newsstand, okay, uh, stocks and reminders, and I want to put it in a folder called stuff I maybe not, might not really want to use. Well, all you have to do is press and hold on any app, and they start to jiggle just like that. And all I have to do is drag one app into the other. So let's drag newsstand into reminders. And it's going to try to guess what you want to call this. In this case, it thinks I'm going to call it productivity. I'm just going to hit the X and call it crap. And then if I want to move other stuff into crap, I can just, again, drag and drop. And it'll place it right in there for me. Very, very simple. Now, certain apps you can delete, but any apps that come with the phone, you cannot. Now, you'll notice that on this screen, there are a total of three apps that did not come with the phone. Yap is one of them, 1Password is the other, and Cal, which I already made a reference to, is another. Um, now, I have a lot more apps on my phone than this. I'm just hiding it on page two. Um, but the reason why I wanted to uh, put these up here is I think that they could really help most of you. So the reason why I bring up Yap. So Yap is a service that anyone can use to create an app. Why would you be interested in this? Because the PC Classes Online app lives within Yap. So all you do is you go to the App Store and download Yap and I'll have a hyperlink uh, in the description of the video. But from here, you can uh, gain access to all of our classes. You can even, if you look there uh, at the bottom, it says classes, you can sign up for live classes, like the one that I just taught a few minutes ago. So you can go through this. It's a free app. It's really fun and easy. Uh, you can check that out. 1Password, we just did a class on it. You actually probably saw it on the last screen. 
but it's for saving your passwords. So for anyone who has trouble out there with remembering their passwords, to put one password on your phone is free. If you want to sync it with a computer, that's the part where you have to pay for it, and you may want to take the class on that one just to learn how to better use it. Cal, another great app, um, replaces the calendar that comes with the phone, um, and it's uh, very, very friendly. I'm going to give you just a few other apps by name that I do recommend to most people. Um, I think these, I think of these as being very universal apps. They appeal to people of all different ages. The first one is Evernote. Evernote is a great note-taking or writing application. Um, it's free. The next one, my favorite app, Zeit. Z-I-T-E. It's sort of like Pandora, but for news. So basically with Zite, you tell it what topics interest you, and it creates a custom magazine based around those topics. Once again, that one is Zite, and it is free as well. Google makes their own app, which has some features that compete with Surrey, um, but it's a very well-built app. Do I think it's better than Surrey? Eh, at this stage of the game, probably not. Weatherbug is another handy one. It just seems to have more accurate weather information than certain other apps, like the one that comes with the phone. And uh, that'll do it for that. Next feature that we're going to talk about here is something called multitasking. And this is more good to know um, in terms of if you have an app that maybe just isn't quite performing the way it should. So let's see, what was the last app I opened? The last app I opened was Yap. So let's say I'm using Yap and it crashes on me. It's just frozen, okay? Well, here's the thing. If I'm in Yap and it's all frozen on me and I hit the home button, okay, that app is actually still running right now in the background. So if it's crashing and I just try to go back into it, it's just going to resume where it left off. This is where it's important to know how multitasking works so that you can quit. So the way you do this is you double click the home button. So press it twice, and it kind of pulls back, and you can see all the different apps that are here running in the background. So all you have to do is swipe up with your finger, and it will clear out. So if you have an app that is not responding, that's the easiest way to clear it out. And you'll notice that now when I go into it, it's just like it was when I first went into the program. Um, the key app that I have found that crashes more than anything out there is Facebook. Next, uh, I want to talk about um, something that's ever so slightly off topic, but it's worth mentioning. And I mentioned this at the beginning of the class, Wi-Fi. So if you have an iPhone 6 or newer, or an, iPhone, an iPad Air 2 or newer, and then of course the various computers, um, I want to go over a little piece of terminology for all of you. So there have been many different generations of wireless. It started with A, went from A to B, B to G, because apparently we don't like going in true order, G to N, and now the current standard is called AC. There's a very, very big difference between AC wireless and N. And the reason why I bring this up is you've, if you have an iPhone 6 or newer, you have this newer technology. But if you have an old wireless router in your home, you're not really accessing it. So if you have an older router, it is worth it to buy a new one. And I want to give you an example of how different these are. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take you over here to my side of my phone. This is uh, not just apps that I use. It's a bunch of apps that I'm demoing. So I wouldn't necessarily uh, say, oh, look, David's got that app. I better get it. It's got to be good. Not, not necessarily. I, I may be just demoing it. So if we go actually back for just one moment to settings, you will notice here under Wi-Fi, that I have a five gigahertz network. Now, what I'm about to show you is the Airport Extreme, okay? This is the Apple Airport Extreme, link in the description of the video. This is, in my opinion, the best wireless router out there. It's right around $200. If you get it through our link, it's actually about, I think, $20 less than that. So, I'm gonna go here and I'm going to run what's called a speed test. So this is testing the speed of the internet. Now the, the numbers here are going to be slightly skewed because of the fact that I do use Wi-Fi to transmit the signal from my phone to my computer so that all of you can see this. So just watch the difference here. So watch, I'm gonna run a speed test. This is on the high, the new technology. Okay, and let's see what it achieves. And I don't worry about the ping number, I worry about the download number. So if you look here, we're at 
90, oh God, 100 megabits per second, okay? And right around 12 upload. So what I'm gonna do at this point, and this software may crash, I may need to do some clever editing at this point, but I'm going to switch networks from the high speed network to the lower speed network. I'm gonna have to blur the screen for a moment. Okay, so now we're in the slower speed network, and this would be the equivalent if you're on one of those older routers. So watch the speed difference between what you just saw, which was 100 megabits down, and this. So look at that, 100 megabits versus right around 23, just by a difference in a router. It's the same internet connection, but one can broadcast much further and much faster. More, more faster than further, actually. So if you uh, have these new devices in your home, that is my proof for you. It is worth the extra money to get a good router. Again, link to that router will be in the description of this video. I really hope you've enjoyed this class. Um, if you want to check out more of our classes, like I said, you can either view our YouTube channel um, or you can visit our website at pcclassesonline.com. You'll also see on your screen at this point, there is gonna be a direct link. So if you want to take that class on how to improve your battery life, uh, you can find that there. And um, please tell your friends about our service. We are completely open source, free to the public. This is David A. Cox with pcclassesonline.com. You all have a wonderful day. Class dismissed.